And we're just going to get kicked off here this morning with the strategy huddle. We're excited to, to have everybody participating. Uh, this is our official launch of the strategy huddle, and we're looking forward to building this over the next couple months. Um, my name is Ryan, and I'm an account manager and product manager here at My Strategic Plan. So if you call into the office, I'm frequently on this side of the phone. Um, the purpose of the strategy huddle is we know everybody out there is doing great things with their strategic planning, uh, and there's some good questions out there, and you also have some best practices. The other side, we're uh, being M3 Planning and My Strategic Plan. We operate in the world of planning on a daily basis, and we wanted to share some of our best practices as well as what we're hearing uh, with our consulting engagements. The focus, as she says, is the real world, answer real world questions, handle high level strategy issues, and share best practices on strategy, execution, and planning. This is not a rehearsed presentation, so um, there's going to be some live questions coming in. We encourage the participation and, and we welcome it. Um, if you have any questions, um, or actually the duration of the call is going to be 45 to 60 minutes. We're hoping to keep it in that time frame. We go a little bit short, we will take additional questions on the back end. And if you have any questions as we go through the presentation, if you have a real-world example that uh, how, if you relate to a question, go ahead and on the right-hand side you'll see a uh, raise your hand button. If you raise your hand, we'll unmute you, and you, you can share a little bit of how you have solved that problem yourself um, and provide a suggestion. If you have a question that you would like to have answered on the back side of the, uh, of the presentation, if we have the time after the, these uh, initial questions are uh, presented, then we will take those questions. So if you want to do that, on the right-hand side, on the bottom, there's a chat box. Go ahead and submit any questions that way. And I, what I'll do is just get, right, get going. We're going to introduce today's strategy huddle leaders, and that is Erica and Howard. Both are co-founders of M3 Planning which is the parent company of My Strategic Plan and the brains behind the intellectual property in the system, and that is M3 Planning. Erica is also the author of Strategic Planning for Dummies book. If there's interest in that, we do have it on the website. And Erica also has several spot training videos that are hosted on YouTube, so there, you can put a face behind the name if, if you have not met or uh, seen any of those videos before. Both Erica and Howard are, uh, Howard are involved in the My Strategic Planning system in day-to-day -day operations but they're also on the road half the month uh, facilitating strategic planning meetings, sessions, and working with the customers uh, on a daily basis. With that said, we'll turn the call over to Erica, and we're going to get the ball rolling. Well, thanks, Ryan, and, and uh, thanks for the introduction, and welcome, everyone. Um, and Howard just wanted to, to introduce Howard as well. He's our um, CEO, and uh, he also has a PhD in, in marketing with an emphasis in research. So, uh, a lot of the work we do on the on the strategy side and the research side, uh, he's the brains behind that. So, good morning, Howard. Good morning, Erica. And speaking about being on the road, Erica is in uh, Nashville right now, joining us. So, good morning, or yeah, it's still morning for you. That's right. So, and I know we have callers from all over the country, so um, we're just really, really excited uh, to have a group of strategy leaders in a fairly intimate setting um, talking through some, as Ryan had mentioned, some important stuff uh, that's going on in strategy today. And um, I'm just going to ask uh, Howard, and, and on your end, if you wouldn't mind muting your phone, we're getting a little bit of reverb. There we go. That's great. Um, so some of the questions that came in, and this is how we set it up, we just said, hey, what's on your mind? What do you want to hear about? Uh, what's, what's bothering you? Or, or what might you want to brainstorm around in the world of strategy and execution? We got a bunch of, a bunch of feedback um, from you all. Uh, they kind of grouped around two specific topics, at least for this um, huddle, and we'll be doing this monthly, so we'll certainly pick up some more questions uh, next month and the following months. But we had a lot, quite a few questions around um, leadership, um, getting leadership buy-in, and then and, and engagement around strategic planning. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then something we're sharing a lot about, and, and you asked the question as well, is how do we effectively plan uh, when the environment is changing so rapidly? So we'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing. And again, um, as Ryan said, um, at the end of each of these segments, we're going to ask if you have something to share that's working for you and your organization, um, raise your hand, and we'd love to, we'd love for you to share with everybody on the call what's working for you. So, um, really under the spirit of, um, 
that, 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 that wisdom of the crowd. And today we are the crowd of folks that are, are really trying to drive results in our organizations in this really tough economy. So, um, so with that in mind, we're going to focus on those two topics. And then um, if we have time at the end, as Ryan had mentioned, we'll take any questions you might have on the fly. If we can't get to them, um, we'll either answer them offline or we'll, we'll add them to the agenda for, for next month. So with that, I um, wanted to just start to kind of share one strategy stat. Um, and I like to share strategy stats that come our way um, from various organizations, um, global organizations such as McKinsey, just because I think it's helpful for all of us to kind of have some data, uh, especially when we're um, needing to talk to uh, the C-suite about strategy and planning, and also to benchmark ourselves to see um, how we're doing against other organizations. So looking at the slide um, and the, the graph in front of you, I just want to point um, our attention to the third one down here, uh, which is the length of the strategic planning process. And this was a survey that was done in June, as you can see, and looking to see how the, how the economy is impacting organizations and what has changed in organizations, either positively or negatively. And you can see the length of the strategic planning process along with uh, the number uh, and the amount of time, the number of people and the amount of time uh, that strategic planning um, is taking for organizations. In both those cases, um, pretty big, significant um, increases. That's positive or negative, uh, depending upon uh, how you look at it. Um, but certainly it sounds to me from this survey that people are spending more time um, thinking about how to plan and how to be strategic um, in, this, uh, in this economy. So it's just kind, of a, just kind of a fun stat. So with that, as a, a bit of a backdrop, let's jump into the first question, a uh, set of questions that came our way around leadership buy-in and engagement. Uh, we did keep the questions or the questions of whoever up submitted this question anonymous um, in the event that uh, and in the event that um, there were other folks on the phone that we said you didn't want to know that you asked that question. So uh, so we omitted names. You can kind of see the questions on the screen. Um, one was um, our CEO wants a plan in place, but he won't set the strategic direction. Uh, we see that a lot, um, and you might be experiencing that in your organization uh, where you really um, you're charged with uh, leading a strategic planning process or initiative, but you need the, the but the CEO won't first set the set the vision or the BHAG as the case may be, um, and that can be a little bit challenging. So there's some things we can talk about in that regard. And then um, a second question, a little bit more specific, when you have a champion in a closely held organization, how do you communicate to the other owners their role in the process? They want strategy, but it seems like others they want others to be responsible for it. And certainly um, that's something we see as well uh, where perhaps there's a, if it sounds like in this organization there's a distributed uh, leadership uh, structure and one uh, person thinks it's important and the others don't. And so how do you deal with that? Um, so certainly a, a lot of different situations and we know that leadership is in and of itself a whole discipline. And um, so we're just going to touch upon uh, the answers to these questions in relation to the strategic planning process. So our goal in answering some of these questions is to be really specific with some suggestions that you can really use in your organization. So we've tried really hard to, to be specific in, in solutions. And, um, and one of those is that strategy. We, I just really believe that in order to, in order to convince the C-suite that strategic planning is important, um, strategy needs to drive results. And I'm going to turn it over to Howard to talk to us about, um, about some of the statistics that are on this slide. Howard? This uh, study that's kind of represented up here is an ongoing process that uh, we do uh, we collect information, and it's uh, it's based upon uh, the average of, of clients and customers that are out there. So when you see the top one where it says impact of strategic planning, 12% increase, you say, well, why should I do it just for a 12% increase? What that number really represents is the amount of increase above people or businesses in general. So in other words, if you don't do planning much or you just kind of run business as usual and so forth, you'd have a 12% less increase in sales volume or you'd have 11% less increase in net profit. And these are all self-reported uh, numbers we have. And we've got, oh, I don't know, 100, well, probably well over 1,000 in our database where, these, uh, where this information came from. So the, the point being there is that the effort takes some time but it does drive uh, an increase above business as usual, so there is a real benefit. 
And also, just jumping down to the bottom one there, the impact of uh, the balanced scorecard, which we definitely advocate as part of the uh, best practices of planning. Uh, when you use the balanced scorecard, you find that you have a, a, a much better uh, overall holistic uh, way to manage your business. So you're just not focused on net profit. You, as you all know, in the balanced scorecard, we look at the three other perspectives as well. So it gives us a, an overall impact, and our performance increases also with how we handle our people, how our processes are become more efficient, and how closer we get uh, in touch with our customers. So this is a result of our work over the years. Uh, we continue to add to it and so forth. So again, this is just the average. We've got people that have definitely had substantial 20, 30, 40 percent increase in sales volume. And obviously there's some folks that on the other side that they work really hard and because of different situations in their organizations don't get the increase they'd like to. But on the average, uh, you're, there's definitely a return for your efforts many fold over. Erica? I think that's great. You know, one thing that I wanted to mention, is especially if uh, your C-suite is sort of is a data data driven or your leadership is are, are data driven individuals, um, there is a great study uh, by Bain and Company, the, the uh, management consultancy. And uh, if you just Google uh, Bain ma management, the management tools study, they do a study every year uh, to see what are the most effective and most widely used management tools um, that you know that organizations um, are using. And again, just to kind of you know, if you need some external validation, um, strategic planning is always in the top three uh, management tools. At least it has been over the over the ten year uh, period that they've been doing the doing the research. So just really great data, uh, super easy to find. So I recommend that as well if you're looking for another data point uh, to to convince leadership and and to get that buy in. Another thing, as a as a thought to put out there is. You know, we can only do so much as strategy leaders if we ourselves are not the CEOs um, and we are driving the strategic planning process, but, but we're not, we're, we're not um, the leader of the organization. And I think this change formula, this is just a standard change form, formula um, that, that is widely used that, you know, people have to want to do something differently. We have to want uh, you know, leaders need to want to see something different. And the way that this works is that the dissatisfaction times the vision or the future potential, times the specific uh, concrete steps that can be taken towards making that vision or, or identifying those, that those components need to be greater than resistance to change. And frankly, if, if those aren't greater, if those are all zeros, for example, um, the need to change uh, decreases pretty pretty substantially and, and we're maybe um, we're not going to get a lot of traction as it relates to putting a strategic planning process in place because perhaps there's certainly not um, up the need for, or at least there's not the perceived need, uh, that this management tool will make a difference in the organization. So I just wanted to share that because we need to be honest with ourselves that sometimes sometimes we're just, uh, we can push really hard and, and, um, and not get anywhere. And so that's just kind of a, kind of a, a framework to think about what, what kind of change, if change, if the organization is ready for change. Um, and if so, then um, then there's some of the other suggestions that we've been sharing um, that you can certainly put in place. Uh, I will say uh, from our work, and you're probably seeing this as well, the the use of a strategic plan or just even the, the process of strategic planning um, certainly is rising right now, given the given uh, what's going on in the marketplace. And and I think you can you, I'm sure you're seeing that in your organizations as well. So uh, looking for a little bit more intentionality in what we're doing. Here's a, just another suggestion, and I just feel really strongly about this, um, that, you know, we need to think about strategic planning as a business process. And it is a core business process that organizations either implement or they don't implement. Um, and applying uh, best practices in process management, um, I just applied the RASICS, uh, which um, some of you may have heard for others that may be new, um, this is a great technique in process management, which is just identifying the process. In this case, it's strategic planning. And you can see on the bottom of the screen here what the RACIX acronym stands for is who's responsible for the process, who has approval over actions that are being taken in the process, who's supporting the process, who's informing the process, and who's consulting the process. And I just broke down in the table above 
um, that key that, you know, at the end of the day, the CEO is responsible or, or, or the leader is responsible for the strategic planning process. That doesn't necessarily mean uh, that he or she is, is running the process, but, but they are certainly uh, responsible for the process, and they are certainly responsible for approving whatever comes out of the process. Um, I, on the next step down, and I just, you know, I put the facilitate it um, as sort of a, an item that gets added to the RASIC thing that, you know, someone has to run the process um, to support the CEO. Obviously, uh, they're not doing that themselves. Sometimes it's the HR. Um, some of the folks on the phone today um, are actually in a strategy office um, role, and so the strategy office is CSO. Perhaps it's outsourced. Um, you may be a, a consultant uh, like we are that we actually get the, the process is outsourced to us or, or to yourself. Um, certainly the leadership team is responsible for supporting it, and they're responsible for driving it in their departments and, the, and to, to, to the levels in their organization that they're responsible for. The entire organization is responsible for informing the process and supporting it, and then, of course, from a consult, consultation perspective, um, oftentimes industry experts. So I think that's kind of a just applying process management techniques um, to – uh, to strategic planning, and, and the number one thing is the CEO absolutely needs to lead it. And, and one thing um, that we won't do, and, and I'm sure a lot of you on the phone agree with this as well, is that the CEO is not 100% engaged um, in strategic planning. Uh, we won't work with the organization because we know it will fail. So if you're one of those folks um, out there that's really struggling with this, I hope a couple of these ideas um, will give you the talking points that you need. Um, just kind of here's a summary uh, set of slides, a uh, set of um, actions or ideas. But I'd like to just pause for a moment and ask uh, folks that are on the phone, do you have a specific suggestion or a solution to getting um, leadership involved that you, you, you have used in your organization that you'd like to share um, with everyone? And if you do, um, please just hit the raise your hand uh, button and we'll unmute you. We'll take just a minute and see if See if anybody has um, something to share about a suggestion or a solution that has worked for you to help get leadership engaged in the in the strategic planning process. And I'm seeing no hands go up. So, okay. Sarah, well, if, if, yep. I've I've got a little thought here as well uh, on this because. As we are, you know, we, we see so many times uh, people look at strategic planning as a huge investment, and it is. It does take time and so forth. But in the long run, it does save time. It, so they're looking for an ROI in the front end. You know, am I going to get some kind of return from doing all this extra effort? So to, to piggyback on, on what you're saying about that Bain study, so if people can't find that, they can uh, email our office. Actually, strategic planning was added to that Bain study back in 1996, and it's been the number one tool uh, used internationally uh, for management purposes, the number one for every year. And for the last 10 years, it's had the top satisfaction of any of the top 25 uh, management tools. So this is not just something because uh, we put, put it together, whatever is out there. This is the result of organizations around the world. This is best practices, this is principles and how you do it in your company to get the return is, is up to you, but it's definitely based upon really solid foundation, and it's uh, something that uh, you can use and take the information to the leadership in the organization to show them that there is a uh, benefit for doing this work. Yeah, that's great. It. I think another thing that I, I've been uh, processing a lot lately, too, is, is questioning organizations to say, well, you know, if you have a budget, which most everybody does, and we're budgeting for some budgeting, at all, which we do, uh, what are we budgeting for? And I think that's a really good thing to ask. You know, what are we applying resources and people to accomplish? Uh, what are we paying for? And if we're not clear, if we don't have a plan, whatever the plan looks like, we don't, we're, not really, we're not really sure what we're applying time and money to. And so that's just kind of another um, thing that I think is a, a, a point, uh, especially – as you said about the, the ROI component, of, you know, we expect to see an ROI on all of the all of the funding we receive or the or the revenue we generate from our customers and the expenses that go out to to deliver that value. So, and, and um, strategic planning should help us make sure that we're we're aligning that time and money component. So, okay, if something comes to you as we're moving through, uh, do you like to share? Certainly, hit that raise your hand button. Um, there are some summary actions that hopefully can help you, and if you're if you're challenged with or having challenges with the 
the leadership in your organization uh, around strategic planning. Let's jump into the next question uh, that we had, which is, you know, and, and this comes in a variety of different forms. You know, the economy is volatile. Our industry is volatile. Um, how do we plan in such a dynamic environment? You know, we're going to share some ideas here, some of which may feel really overwhelming and, and others are pretty straightforward. And so uh, depending upon where you are in your strategic planning process, um, you know, some of these may work. Some of these uh, may be sort of level two kind of things that you're looking for. So um, want to be a little bit mindful, too. I know we have folks on the, on the phone today, some from government, some from nonprofit, some from the private sector. And I absolutely think, um, absolutely think that, um, what, how we plan for this environment as budgets are getting slashed or as customers are going out of business, um, it's impacting, absolutely impacting all of us. All right. So uh, kind of jumping in, one of the first suggestions that we had is, you know, we, we assuming, I'm going to make an assumption that we have our, our strategic plan in place uh, that is accompanied with uh, key performance indicators, KPIs, and, and the suggestion related to this would be that we're not just using our uh, dashboard, our, our visual representation of our key performance indicators um, as a history lesson, but we're actually using it for uh, predicting early, you know, what, what might be happening or as early warning buoys. And so this is, of course, just an example of a, a very simple a dashboard. I'm sure some folks on the phone have much more uh, in-depth and, and uh, thorough dashboards, but just to kind of put in our minds that thinking about using our dashboard, thinking about using our KPIs as early warning buoys. And someone shared with me yesterday um, that one of the organizations that he was working with, um, the German pharmaceutical company, that they actually, and I, I it's just this sounds crazy to me, um, but that they use their KPIs and they actually have indicators uh, that predict out 25 years. Um, just because their cycle time is so large, of course, um, but and also because of the you know the German structure, um, really really using their uh, KPIs and and um, and for them sort of a 25 year look out um, to make sure that they know what's happening in the organ in the organization. So and in the industry, um, how would you have anything to add on on um, how to use KPIs as early warning beliefs? Uh Not at this point. I think I'll hold my thoughts for the next couple slides. All right, perfect. So how this comes to fruition in your organization may look um, slightly different, but just pushing the idea of, of using the dashboard um, as, as a bit more of, of a predictive indicator. The next suggestion that we would have is, first, making sure that you have a robust financial model. And this may seem completely obvious. Um, however, not everybody has a financial model um, in place in their organization. And it may, this might be one of these things that feels overwhelming. Um, but I would certainly recommend that this, if, for, the first thing is on a level one kind of action is making sure that you have a financial model that you can do scenario analysis on. Um, and tons of resources out there about how you actually do that. That's kind of a level two thing. Um, this was just a, a great case study from what UPS is doing right now. And you can see the information that's on the screen. Um, that they're not necessarily focusing on perfect forecasting, um, and I think that's really, I think that's a really uh, good point. Um, but instead, actually, they're establishing a range of possibilities, and this is just standard scenario analysis stuff, such as establishing sort of a mid, high, mid, low, um, you know, type of, of, of scenarios using your financial model to look at what if, some, if, a, if a big catastrophic event would happen, might happen, one of your big customers uh, goes out of business, taking that revenue stream out and seeing. Seeing, uh, seeing what the financials actually look like, and, and, and again, just kind of making sure that you have a dynamic model that you can plug and play and, and look at where the stress points are. So that's one piece. The other piece that you can see on the slide here is um, something that people are struggling with is, so we, we have a lot of times our financial models, of course, to set our key performance indicators to drive performance in our organizations. Well, um, we don't know because it feels like the industry is so volatile. It feels really hard sometimes right now to predict uh, what the 2010 revenue might be, for example. Um, as, you know, grantors maybe aren't granting as much money or, again, like I said, maybe customers are going out of business, et cetera. Um, how do we drive performance? How do we use um, our, our performance metrics uh, and realistically use them to, to drive performance but knowing that the industry is, you know, we don't know what it's going to be like in, in six months. And something that UPS is doing is actually looking at ratios instead of a fixed goal. And so this may, this may, you know, take very different, um, 
very, very different uh, views and looks in your organization, but kind of thinking about, you know, maybe it's a revenue to cost uh, kind of ratio. Um, so you can actually use that as the target as opposed to a, you know, X million dollar uh, revenue goal. And we're just working with an organization right now that um, they're really struggling with this and we're spending an awful lot of time uh, trying to get that revenue number. What's the revenue number for 2010? And a lot of pushback, of course, um, around around setting a really specific number because of, of some volatility, volatility in their industry. And as we all know, a lot of times the incentive compensation plans are really, um, really specific um, tied to, to revenue or, you know, hopefully it's tied to more than that, but oftentimes we know less, it's, it's tied to revenue. And so suggested to them that we use ratios instead of a fixed goal um, and that, that, that sort of calms down sort of the stress on setting uh, performance measures uh, for 2010. That said, they have a pretty robust financial model that allows them um, to stress test the organization. So, Howard, do you want to talk about um, some more guidance on, on financial modeling and scenario analyses? Okay, uh, I just want to throw a point in here. You've used the word robust a number of times, and granted there's definitely some organizations we're working with uh, that do have a, a robust, quote, model, but we're also seeing in the, in the mid-market for those, there's just a lot of people that have a challenge in trying to put something together. So my encouragement would be to sit down, even with the old Excel spreadsheet, and look at uh, your future based upon the maybe customer types or, and uh, uh, forecast based on that or based upon markets and so forth. But I definitely would start with something with some high, low, and medium, uh, just even taking, like I said, the Excel spreadsheet. Also, what, what we're seeing now is that the, uh, the old SWOT analysis uh, really needs to come in play. If, if I just was... I don't want to thumb back to it, but the, uh, the McKinsey study that you uh, uh, we started out with, uh, we've, we're seeing that uh, there's a lot of more participants involved in in this uh, the planning process. So it's important to really dig down and, and get information from the boots on the street, uh, from vendors and so forth, and and make that SWOT analysis a moving picture and not a snapshot. We've seen over the years that so much time they somebody does uh, a SWAT one time a year when they're doing the uh, their street planning process, and then that's it. They don't do any more with it, and then they pull it out again. But I would assign somebody to start collecting information on a daily basis. Uh, for example, yesterday, uh, uh, Harris International uh, uh, came up with a billion dollar loss in their net profits for the last quarter. So we work with a number of gaming companies, you can imagine being out of Reno and so forth, and that's a piece of information that should be put in a SWAT just to start using it to forecast for the future. And the second thing that I would include in there as well is start going back and digging into lead and lag uh, KPIs. Uh, or leading la lead indicators and so forth. So not just looking at the lag stuff, the financial, the market share, and so forth. What's driving those things? So is, is the market changes. One of the things that we were we've been talking about uh, is is trying to estimate maybe a, a year out and then adjust it on a quarterly basis. That's the beauty of having a strategic plan. Uh, the challenge being tying that to uh, financial or a compensation plan. And therein lies, I think, with, with the uh, UPS program using a ratio where we are tying those different factors to uh, changes in revenue makes a whole bunch more sense than just tying to a specific number because, uh, as we've seen over the last couple weeks now, pardon? Uh, as we've seen over the last couple weeks, uh, folks are really concerned about the, the forecast and so forth because, it, as Erica said, it can be a real demotivator. And it's a challenge. And so I'd really like to hear from folks, other strategic leaders and so forth, what they may be doing because as we put this challenge on the table to many people, it, it really seems to be a uh, uh, concern that so many folks are having when they're doing their planning process. So uh, whether it's robust or not, uh, definitely start uh, uh, your scenario analysis and uh, keep it current and not just as a snapshot. Erica? Great. Um, I think that's great, and I think, um, again, the concept of, of making sure that's current and that we're also we're actually using it, and you can kind of see the ideas on the slides here um, as well, is just, 
is, is to really actually stress test the model. So that really means, and you can see there, you know, you know what a, a real serious decrease in revenue, uh, if it was 50% or a loss of a major grant, your budget, uh, if you're in the governmental uh, sector, uh, gets, uh, you know, slashed by 50%, you know, whatever it happens to be. What, what really um, is it going to take? Uh, where are the real stressors? Uh, on the organization and using that to be a bit proactive in planning. So that's one thing that I think has been, been really, really effective um, to deal with a dynamic uh, environment and trying to get ahead of it. That's sort of really the point. Another suggestion, and this sort of depends who your customers are, but I sort of like this idea of just you know, staying closer to your customers. And I, I think that we know this, um, but it's just really great for all of us to remember that we just need to um, be a bit more, and I'm going to use sort of a, a strong word, maybe a bit more aggressive um, in our in our uh, customer connection. And these are four uh, behaviors from research that actually drive growth, uh, repurchase, uh, buying additional lines of service, referrals, uh, and constructive uh, constructive feedback. I I think you know we also talk a lot about the fact that we're not just trying to drive you know satisfaction with our customers, but we're of course trying to drive loyalty. Um, and 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 those are of course all these things that are listed here are indications of loyalty. Uh, we can talk about it from a data perspective, but that's just a behavioral uh, behavioral uh, ex- you know some examples that that would that would indicate whether our customers are loyal. Um, one thing that just came out recently, and I thought this was such an interesting idea from one of the organizations um, that we're working with, said uh, the research they're finding is that the um, that the, uh, I think the word it was aggressive, but um, the, the salesperson that actually is um, really um, um, pushing uh, their clients. So that's the type of a type of uh, selling that's working in today's economy. And I know that's just, well, if we think about pushy in sales, it just sounds like too much. But um, I think especially, I know we have some consultants on the line today um, in our really um, – being proactive and really going out and, and, and pushing our clients to do uh, more and really, in this case, drive the strategic planning process, that's what's actually helping um, people um, close more deals right now. And that is kind of that staying closer to your customer, really working on um, your strategic accounts and driving that value. So these are just some interesting, uh, again, some interesting behaviors. Um, I just wanted to share uh, this is just an example of a really a simple dashboard about this concept of of making sure that we have dynamic, real-time data about our customers, or of course, organizations are not necessarily investing in this kind of thing right now, but this is an example of a dynamic dashboard, um, and you can kind of see the little dial that's up in the corner here. Um, that is a sort of an indicator of loyalty uh, based on um, the NPS program, and we just wanted to share and put a thought in your mind about, um, you know, if you're already doing a customer satisfaction survey, uh, making sure that you're embedding a best practice of the net promoter score. Um, and Howard, do you want to just brief, briefly talk about that? Folks are probably familiar, but if you're not, let's just let's talk about what it is. Uh, the net promoter program, as you've uh, mentioned there, Eric, has uh, definitely come online fairly strong over the last five, six years. It's, uh, it's a program that uh, came out of Bain and it's now championed by a fellow by the name of Reichel. You can Google that and you can get a lot of information, but it's very simple. It's all around the concept of how likely are you to recommend a particular product or a service or a company to a good friend or colleague. Are you willing to put this? It's cause you're, are your customers willing to put, a, so to speak, a little pound of flesh in the game? Uh, that particular uh, program, uh, the higher your, your customers rank you on that, uh, the more profitable the growth is, as Eric had mentioned in, in a previous slide, uh, loyal customers are, are willing to repurchase, they're willing to get constructive feedback. Uh, the, the dynamic dashboard that you see on, uh, on, on the page there is something that we've used with uh, a number of clients where the, uh, the graphs you see are based upon their value proposition because their value drives the loyalty and it's, and it's all based upon uh, real-time data with a, a, an open-ended box where uh, customers uh, provide their actual thoughts and so forth and they use it extensively in uh, uh, service recovery. So this is a way that we're finding that uh, customers, uh, that we can get their feedback and we can make changes on, on an ongoing basis. It is on the cutting edge of uh, areas. Uh, a CMO report, Chief Marketing Officer report uh, of about six months ago found that only of the big companies, only about 25% of companies have a real 
program in place to collect this information, even though 92% of them say this is really important. So uh, this would be a best practice we'd share with you, establish some way to stay close to your customer and get their actual feedback and then be able to measure it because loyal customers drive bottom line. Perfect. Thank you, Erica. That's great. Here's a, a sort of another pretty tactical, tactical thing to share. Um, and this may, may or may not resonate, but uh, it, it may be a way to think about how to keep your strategy agile. And I kind of like that word, agile. And uh, one thing we talk a lot about, especially, you know, about strategic planning is, you know, if the strategic plan isn't helping uh, inform decision-making throughout the organization, then we have a plan that's not relevant, you know, and, and we get that old adage that the plan sits on the shelf. That, of course, requires that the plan is, um, is, is relevant by making sure that it's updated, so to speak. And I think this is just sort of a really, really great schedule. Again, you may have one in your organization, but just wanted to, wanted to share with you if you don't the concept of, of course, not just looking and not just planning on an annual basis, but thinking about, um, maybe adapting uh, your plan on a quarterly basis. I think what's important about this, though, I just really want to emphasize it, that we're trying to say that let's be intentional about uh, changes to our plan, changes to our strategy. So a um, quick little overview of, of what we're looking at on the slide here. Of course, we have an annual strategy update, um, and I, I tried to sort of color code this, that the stuff in green is strategy development and the stuff in red uh, is strategy execution. So uh, the concept being that um, we actually would bring topics um, and issues to the strategic issues uh, to the table um, at the leadership level. Um, at, at, okay, so this is on a quarterly basis. This certainly can be done on a monthly basis, but we're just working on a quarterly concept right now. Um, to say, all right, we're going to um, prep our issues and we're going to specifically talk about strategic issues facing the organization on a quarterly basis and update um, the strategic plan based on uh, the information that's coming out of those, that particular meeting. So leading up to that, of course, is that we're, um, we of course rolled out the plan, um, but that we're um, holding strategy sessions on a monthly basis. So I know that sounds like more meetings that can be embedded in different ways in organizations. We've seen all kinds of things, but just the concept that we're talking about strategy and we're really looking at the data and the numbers from our dashboard on and making decisions uh, based on the information on a monthly basis. So month one and month two, you can see that. And then in month three, we also have that data, but we're having a longer session um, where we're actually vetting what's going on. We're bringing that SWOT information to the table that Howard was just talking about, uh, and we're maybe changing the plan based on what's happening in the environment. I think um, certainly maybe people are doing this on a monthly basis, but I can just advocate if we could even just do it on a quarterly basis, um, we'd, we'd be doing so much better than just kind of the popcorn effect of, um, oh, the plan's out of date. Looking then um, – how that comes together on a monthly basis that we actually need to have folks providing information and data to us, whether it's the, the concept of roll-up that the folks, uh, that our team members are actually um, providing a status on how they're doing against their goals. That, of course, would roll up to their managers, which would roll up to maybe a department strategy session, and then that, that leadership team strategy session that I just spoke about uh, previously. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is just to say, we need, of course, to know how we're doing throughout the organization. That information needs to come up to us um, through through the mechanisms that we've set in place, whatever systems you have in place. Um, that needs to come to the leadership team. We need to hear about it at the leadership level and then on a quarterly basis uh, making decisions and maybe adapting the plan. And then, of course, that gets rolled back down to the organization. So really like the concept of, of uh, that someone shared with me that, you know, when when – if, if I'm the CEO, that I, if I need to steer the organization five degrees to the left, that everybody follows with me. And that's really um, the intent of, of, of sharing this particular concept and schedule of, of thinking about planning on a quarterly basis or at least adapting. So kind of some summary items here uh, related to uh, what can we do to keep our, keep our plan relevant and to be agile and to, 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 to plan in this dynamic environment. So, uh, using your KPIs as early warning buoys, so thinking about that as, and, and making sure that you've got KPIs that can function in that way. Um, maybe they're economic indicators, so just thinking about that. We talked about the financial model as well, having one and then using it and stress testing it. Um, staying closer uh, to your customers, especially those strategic accounts. Um, and then um, having a clear schedule and an intentional schedule to talk about strategy and adopt, adapting excuse me, uh, the plan um, as need be. So, um, I wanted to just 
that summarizes the second point. Um, I wanted to just um, take a step back here for a moment. We did have uh, someone uh, submit um, some feedback on um, how they are uh, generating management involvement, and I'm just going to read um, the comment that came in. So to get uh, management involvement, we established an executive steering committee consisting of the top management to approve all results and a SMART, um, that stands for Strategic Management Review Team, um, a smart team of mid-level managers to help inform the process. So, um, so that's what uh, this uh, gentleman is doing in his organization, um, executive steering committee um, that consists of top management uh, to approve all of the results, and then a team of mid-level level managers to help inform the process. Absolutely great. Um, and what I'm sure is working in that as well is that there's clear role definition about who's doing what, and again, that really makes um, strategy come alive in organizations. So, uh, thank you very much for sharing. I'd like to just put out there if anybody has any suggestions um, about how you're planning um, in this dynamic environment. What are you doing or, or how are you keeping your plan relevant? Uh, we'd love to hear. So if you want to raise your hand or, or type in the chat box, uh, please go right ahead. Uh, while we're waiting to see if anybody has anything to share on, on either the leadership topic or the, or the planning topic in, the, in this dynamic environment, Howard, do you have any, um, any closing thoughts? The... Uh primary closing thought I have has to do with staying closer to the customer. Uh, one thing we've learned from a, a major client that we work with, uh, the CEO has said that he wants to make laser sharp decisions and changes. He has backed off of making any kind of uh, changes that are broad reaching. So as a result of his laser sharp decisions, he wants to make sure they're all founded based upon the customer. So he has gone his uh, doubled his activities of uh, supporting his sales staff and uh, doing executive level sailing. So he is hearing the customers, hearing what's changing in their environment, trying to be like the, the first to know type thing so we don't get that information uh, in the newspaper that you're losing a client because they're shut down. But he has doubled his efforts of going out there and he's also making laser sharp decisions not making any kind of broad-reaching things that would have unintended circumstances. So I, I feel of those four points there that we're seeing that uh, getting closer to the customer reaps many, many benefits. The ROI in it is substantial. That's great. It looks like we have a, a couple of folks that have some information to share, and we still look forward to hearing it. So, so Ryan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to to. First one, uh, we have two people raising their hands. We'll go with uh, Tommy, uh, Tommy Smith first. Tommy, do we have you uh, unmuted there? Fundamental of getting back to the fundamental. Of, Tommy, you hear me? over again. Okay. This is just uh, from some limited experience thus far in working with some smaller organizations with strategic planning. We have gone back to the very basic fundamental of defining the mission statement. And in, uh, this has been now on, I think, six occasions. The mission statement changed. And what used to be what I'll call necessary but not meaningful words has now become a filter by which their planning decisions are made. So the, just getting back to the fundamental of what are we called or what are we in business to do and does our mission statement state that clearly and concisely and then how do we go about through the strategic planning process to filter what we do back through that mission statement and so um, that's what I have found thus far is that mission statements are not clear and therefore um, sometimes the, the effort to develop a strategic plan and then follow through with it just seems to not be as meaningful. So um, my encouragement is be sure mission statement is um, clearly states what the company or, or the organization is, is doing. You know, Tommy, I think that's a really great point, and I really appreciate your um, bringing that up. I, I think sometimes in, in, uh, in our work, um, and whatever role we are fulfilling in an organization around the strategic planning process, sometimes we um, we just think, well, we've already got the you know this is you know business 101. We should have that stuff figured out. And you know, I really think, especially right now, sort of reexamining 
and it, this sounds sort of irritating, but it's true, like why we exist as an organization, what value are we providing, what difference are we making in this world, what space should we really be occupying, and and um, and that just all sort of just under under uh, girds and supporting your point about making sure that that we're clear about our purpose and the mission um, the mission that we have uh, as an organization. So thank you. That's a that's a really great point. We have uh, one more hand raised here with Scott Park. I'm going to unmute you, Scott, here. Scott, or Robert, I'm sorry, Robert Parker. Yeah, this is Robert Parker. All uh, right, go ahead. I've been teaching and consulting on strategy for about 25 years, and <clears throat> I've learned that not only is the business of mission important, but also the business of vision. If you can get an organization to think about what they'd like to be in the future, and not too far off, say three years or so, then you can get them to talking about their strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats, because that tells them what the possibilities are. And then you're well on the way to starting the strategic planning effort, because the natural question is, how do we get there? And that's what the strategic planning effort is all about. So that's one comment. I think people should not overlook the power of a vision, a, a description of what the organization will be like in the world to come. Yeah. <clears throat> And then I'm, I'll make another comment on a little different subject. Uh, we were talking about uh, the dynamics of business right now, and I think we approached it almost exclusively from the downturn side. And I believe that in many industries, it's now time to start planning for recovery mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to make yourselves ready for the way it will be in coming years. Thank you so much. I, I think you're absolutely correct. And um, I, I know sometimes just re supporting your point that some of us have probably been involved in um, some processes where uh, vision has taken, a, has taken a long time and, um, and, we're, and we're involved with uh, a couple of uh, organizations right now where I think spending that time to make sure that we're clear about what, where we want to be in the future is just so important, and it's such a powerful tool, and it's just not a, a, some pretty words on a piece of paper. And um, and I think to your point about the recovery comment, absolutely, and and that reinforces that idea of of um, of making sure that we know what that where we want to where 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 we want to be, you know, so we can organize ourselves accordingly um, and take advantage of of things that are are um, hopefully poised. Take off, and certainly, I'm sure of us, some of us are working in industries that are not feeling the downturn per se. Um, just that maybe things are a little more volatile um, than they used to be, um, or maybe maybe not. Maybe that, that's not totally happening, but uh, but certainly um, something that something that we've we've been seeing. But even if it's not volatile, making sure that the strategic plan stays relevant um, as as we grow. So um, so thank you so much for that um, input from from everyone who who shares, and we really hope that we can continue this kind of conversation and, and share uh, the rest of, um, share more ideas as we bring some points forward. Um, Howard, any any last, any thoughts? Thanks, Erica. I, Robert had a really good point. I mean, the reason we really are doing strategic planning is position ourselves to take advantage of the opportunities, you know, with some Chinese Herman says that you know problems. The opposite of the problem is, is the uh, opportunity. We went back to the slide number five when we're looking at the effects of the global economic turmoil in companies. There was two points there I wanted to make to show that there is a ton of opportunities. One says that the ge geographic scope of market in which we offer, 55% of these 1,400 people responded said they're cutting back. Their geographic scope of the mar their markets are cutting back. And we're in a global society, so there is, therein lies opportunity for people that want to take advantage of putting a plan together to move forward. And, and then the other point that I want to make there is that 44% of the folks have cut back on their pace of innovation. 
And we know from strategic planning that innovation is a key component of a process to move forward. And if our competitors are out there are cutting back on their innovation, what an opportunity for us and our clients and, and, and those of us that are forward thinking to take advantage of this void that's probably uh, appearing out there. So, Robert, I really appreciate you uh, bringing that highlight back to us because there are a whole bunch of opportunities out there. We just need to lift our eyes up to the horizon and take advantage and put a plan together and go for it. That's my two cents, Erica. All right. Well, with that, let's wrap us up. Now we're just going to share the date for the next huddle here. Give me a moment uh, to get to to get to that slide. Um, as you've seen, we're trying to just um, to just uh, you know really answer some questions and and um, and talk about things that are plaguing us or share things that are really working for us. And I'm hopeful that um, we can continue to do this in the future. We really want to know what you want to talk about. Um, so. Um, certainly submit your thoughts um, to the email that's on the screen. The next huddle will be on uh, the, uh, the 18th at 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. Of course, these will all be recorded, so they'll be posted as well. Um, we will be um, sending out the, the uh, PDF of today's, uh, of today's uh, presentation in the event that you uh, need it for any future reference. So contact information, here's where we are. Some of uh, you have that. If you don't, there it is. We are totally um, here to to be a resource and love to work together, and uh, especially with um, everybody that's working in strategy, which we get really excited about. So I just want to say thanks to everybody for your time today, and thank you very much for your insights and your thoughts. Um, Howard, thank you for your time, and, and, and Ryan, thanks for hosting. With that, we will uh, wrap it up and, and close today's huddle, and we hope to see you all next month. Thank you. Have a great week.